Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Cryo-EM and Development of Ketamine-Based Antidepressants. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Shujia Zhu, Principal Investigator and Group Leader of the Laboratory of Structure Function Proteins at the Institute of Neuroscience in Shanghai, China. Dr. Zhu, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shu Jia Zhu. I'm coming from the Institute of Neuroscience, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's really a great honor to join this some official scientific webinar. So today I will talk about uh, crowd em and the development of ketamine-based antidepressants targeting to the NMD receptors. Uh, a very brief introduction about my own research experience. So I have been fascinated by the physiological role of the NMDA receptors for the past decade. So I did my PhD training with Dr. Pierre Paoletti at École Normale Supérieure in Paris, where we took uh, uh, advantage of the electrophysiology to study the biophysical, gating, and the pharmacological properties of the NMDA receptors. So then I moved to uh, U.S. and uh, did my postdoc training with Dr. Eric Guo at the Volume Institute, where we used the crowd em to elucidate the four lens uh, NMDA receptor structures. So I joined uh, Institute of Neuroscience of CAS in 2016, and uh, currently in the lab, we are studying uh, all different uh, uh, subtypes of the NMD receptors by combining the structural and the functional approaches. So NMD receptors, they belong to the inotropic glutamate receptor family, which are mainly expressed at the excitatory uh, synapses. They are termed as the coincidence detectors as their activation requires the binding of coagonists, glycine and glutamate, as well as the relief of the voltage-dependent magnesium block. So those NMD receptors, they are highly permeable to calcium and widely involved in the synaptic transmission and the plasticity. So studies in the past decade has demonstrated that the dysfunction of those receptors uh, may contribute to a series of brain disorders. Uh, for example, the hyperactivation of the NMD receptor may lead to ADPD, depression, seizure, chronic pain, and uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, while the hypofunction or hypoactivation of those receptors can also uh, link with the cognitive impairment, schizophrenia, and also recent discovered anti-NMD receptor encephalitis. So one of the drugs called the Mementin uh, is a uh, traditional NMD receptor channel blocker are widely used for the early stage man man management of the Alzheimer's disease. So today we will uh, uh, focus the topic on the depression. So depression, also termed as a major depressive disorder, is a very common mental disorder. So according to the uh, WHO's uh, statistics, uh, globally more than uh, uh, 300 million people all over the world suffered from the depression. And this number is definitely increasing year by year. 
and uh, uh, more women got affected than men and once you get the symptom it can last for uh, almost 10 years so uh, in the uh, in the depression field there are two main series uh, highly linked with clinical medications actually uh, one is the monoamine series so which predicts an impairment of the uh, in the monoaminergic function. So actually most of the currently available antidepressants were, 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 were designed to target to the monoaminergic system. Uh, for example, the famous SSRI uh, is designed to block the serotonin reuptake and maintain the high level of serotonin in the synaptic cleft. So, uh, but I think there are two main disadvantages of those SSRIs. One is that they take, they typically take weeks or even months to produce the effects. Uh, second, they are ineffective in one third of the patient. So then it uh, comes with the second series, the glutamate theory, uh, which indicating the ER balance problem in the depression patient. So in 2019, FDA approved the Spravato from Johnson Johnson. Uh, uh, which is the first drug targeting to the glutamate theory for the treatment resistance depression, as well as those uh, depression patients with suicidal thoughts and actions. So the effective molecule in this spravato is called esketamine, uh, is also a, a non-competitive non NMD receptor channel blocker. So the main advantage of this drug is its action speed is really uh, fast, typically within hours. So uh, let's take a uh, look at the brief history of this magic molecule, ketamine. So it was initially synthesized by uh, uh, American chemist, uh, Carmen Lee Steve in the lab. Then it was widely used as an anesthetic drug for soldiers during the Vietnam War. So uh, as you might know, between the uh, uh, 70s to the 90s in the last century, ketamine began to be popularly used as a club drug. So uh, then uh, I think all, almost all the Western countries made the ketamine as a scheduled three controlled substance. So it seems that the drug, uh, this molecule, was sent to death for the drug development. Then in 2000, uh, a double blend preclinical trial accidentally uncovered its rapid antidepressant effect. So this trial was conducted by a group, uh, by a group from Yale University with only seven depression patients. So all those uh, all the subjects uh, evidenced significant improvement in the depression symptom only four hours after uh, ketamine treatment, and the effect can even last for several days. And also recently, uh, this science paper published in uh, 2019 showed that uh, in the uh, chronic stress uh, animal models, there's a significant uh, reduction of those spine buttons in those mice, while ketamine treatment uh, within 24 hours can significantly restore those spine formations. Uh, also, a study from uh, Zhejiang University by Dr. Hu Hailan's lab showed that in those uh, stress animals, so there's a brain region called the lateral habenula, there's uh, some uh, abnormal uh, NMD receptor activity induced uh, bursting frequency in those uh, uh, stress animals, while ketamine treatment uh, can block uh, those uh, bursting and uh, to rapidly relieve the depression. So it has been long known in the field that uh, uh, ketamine is an NMD receptor channel blocker, but nobody really visualizes the ketamine binding site and understand how uh, ketamine blocks the activity of those NMD receptors. So that's the aim of our uh, research project. So uh, as you might know, NMD receptors, so they are molecularly and functionally diverse. So in, uh, in the rodent brain, so there are total 
uh, in total seven subunits with highly spatial and temporal expression patterns. So the functional NMDA receptors, they are typically tetrameric ensembles. So uh, for our structural study, we picked the GLU-N12A and the GLU-N12B, uh, those two subtypes for the structural uh, study, as there are two major subtypes in the adult uh, for, uh, in the adult forebrain region. So we spend a long time to 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 uh, express and purify those two human NMD receptor subtypes. So as you can see uh, that uh, the, eventually we got those uh, tetrameric formed uh, glu n one two a and glu n one two b NMD receptors. And we also confirmed by electrophysiology and the binding assay that those purified uh, tetrameric receptors have a similar ketamine sensitivity as the four lens uh, NMDA receptors. So uh, uh, thanks to the Crown EM, eventually we got uh, two data set with s ketamine bound uh, human gluon one 2 a or human gluon one 2 b NMD receptor structures. Uh, so eventually, the final resolution is the 3.5 angstrom for 2A and the 4 angstrom for 2B. So as you can see that the whole tetrameric uh, receptor is a huge uh, protein complex. So with the glu N1 subunit uh, marked in gray here, while uh, glu N2A in, in green, while glu N2B in blue uh, uh, here. So with both two data sets, as you can see that the receptor, those two receptors, they have a huge uh, extracellular domains. Uh, and uh, 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 a fragment of the, uh, and the transmembrane domain. So with both two data sets, so the transmembrane domain was uh, consisted with the gate uh, on the top and the selectivity filter on the bottom. Uh, with the uh, 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 central vestibule in between. So with two, both two data sets, we discovered the electron density for S-ketamine molecule in, in, the, in the central vestibule. So to confirm that, that those uh, electron density are indeed the signal for the S-ketamine molecule, we also elucidated an APOE receptor st uh, structure for the glu n one 2 b NMDA receptors. So uh, every, everything is the same, it's just that we didn't add it as ketamine for the, for the, uh, in the protein uh, uh, preparation. So as you can see that uh, clearly there's no density in the uh, central vestibule uh, in this APO state receptors. So next uh, to gain more Insight into the binding of S ketamine, we carried out an MD simulation with S ketamine bound transmembrane domain of the glu n one 2 a receptors uh, as, a, as an initial structure. So the MD simulation showed, so in total, we, we, we performed the three, uh, 500 nanosecond MD simulation. So as you can see, that MD uh, results show the large fluctuations of this S. Uh, s ketamine molecule during uh, this total 500 nanosecond uh, simulation. So we classified, so its initial state was in blue actually. So we, uh, we, we you can see that uh, um, the, the ketamine molecule can move to, a, to the lower pose, which is uh, um, in close proximity to the selectivity filter. So, uh, then we we analyzed the authors MD uh, data and we 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 showed we we reviewed that the this second amine of the ketamine can form a hydro, uh, hydrogen bond with the polar asparagin six one six position in the glue and one subunit in the selectivity filter. So this uh, this uh, configuration was only captured in this lower pose uh, by MD simulation. And we also know, showed that the uh, S-ketamine can interact with this losing 642 position in the glu and 2 a subunit through uh, strong hydrophobic interactions in all the thick configurations. So next, we need to confirm that all those structural and in silico observations are 
uh, are indeed uh, present in the in the in the native tissues. Then we carried out uh, uh, electrophysiology uh, with uh, uh, with the recombinant NMD receptors expressed in the Xenopus oocyte. So uh, first we we uh, we mutated all the surrounding residues in the group and one subunit. So as you can see, the only mutations uh, or, or residue substitutions of this asparagine six one six position to uh, to alanine or to Q to glutamine can uh, got a significant uh, reduction on the ketamine sensitivity, while others uh, residue mutations has had 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 the minimum effect. So with uh, uh, all those function data together, we. Uh, we we again we reviewed that this group and one uh, asparagine six one six was confirmed as a key residue to form the hydrogen bond with ketamine molecule. So next we mutated all the surrounding residues in the group and two A subunit. So we observed that only uh, mutations in the, at this uh, leucine 642 position can got a significant reduction on the ketamine inhibition uh, in gran 1 to a receptors. Then we systematically mutated uh, a series of uh, uh, substitutions uh, at this residue, uh, at this position. So as you can see that by mutating this uh, leucine to valine or isoleucine, we got uh, uh, three to four five-fold reduction on the ketamine sensitivity. While you shorten the losing side chain to alanine, uh, we reduce the ketamine sensitivity by 50-fold. Or when we completely remove the side chain to glycine, then you got a hundred uh, time fold reduction on the ketamine sensitivity. So next we plot this uh, uh, the ketamine IC50 with the amino acid volume uh, uh, at this this position, then we got a very linear fit, which implies that this uh, this hydrophobic interactions are highly uh, steric sensitive. So with all those data together, we confirmed that those hydrophobic interactions are, are definitely uh, the the key binding uh, uh, interaction uh, with the, this molecule. So uh, we were thinking, uh, try to find a human mutations, and uh, then we looked uh, in the in the human genome uh, uh, database, and we noticed that there's a three year old girl uh, carrying exactly a mutation at this uh, leucine six forty two position. So it's a leucine to arginine with a positively charged residue mutation. So uh, it has not been reported what's the uh, problem with this three-year girl. Uh, I hope she will not have any depression uh, phenotype uh, in, in, in her life. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we, we just carried out the functional experiment with this arginine mutation. So as expected, you, you can see that this positively charged arginine completely gets rid of the ketamine binding. So we were thinking, uh, we we were thinking to make a, a knock knock in mice. Hopefully, we can uh, get rid of the ketamine sensitivity in the knockout mice and study the the binding effect uh, with more in vivo approaches. So uh, then we also uh, looked at in the gluon one two B receptor structure, and we confirmed that uh, this uh, hydrogen bond and the hydrophobic interaction are conserved in the gluon one two B NMD receptors. So by mutating those residues to alanine, we also get a fifth, uh, get a fifteen fold reduction on the ketamine sensitivity uh, on gluon one two B receptors. So I think in general we we, we confirm that those interactions are conserved in the uh, gluon one two A and gluon one two B NMD receptors. So next we needed to explain why ketamine's uh, sensitivity was NMD receptor specific. So we did a sequence alignment uh, uh, between the uh, NMD and the non NMD uh, uh, anotropic glutamate receptors. Uh, so as you can see that uh, 
this asparagine 616 position in, in the gluten 1 subunit. So the homologous site in MPA is the uh, uh, in MPA and the kinase, it's the glutamine or arginine residues. So uh, we speculate that this longer side chain of glutamine and arginine are likely to cause the steric disruption with ketamine molecule in MPA and the kinase receptors. So also, uh, a recent study showed that ketamine's metabolic HNK display antidepressant anti actions through NMD receptor independent pathways. So I think our structure explained that uh, the, this hydroxyl group in HNK can largely reduce its binding on the NMD receptors through disruption of the hydrophobic uh, interactions. So finally, uh, uh, in this story, so as you, you, you might know, the ketamine is typically a, a racemic mixture with uh, S, S ketamine and R ketamine enantiomers. So uh, it has been reported that S ketamine is uh, three to five times more potent than R ketamine uh, on the NMDA receptors. But there are uh, several papers, uh, mainly with uh, with the mice or rat models, showed that uh, R ketamine might have long lasting uh, antidepressant effects and uh, fewer side effects. Uh, so those are done in animal models, not in human beings. So we also, with our structure, we also did the MD simulation with r ketamine bound uh, transmembrane domain. So uh, our MD simul uh, data showed that r ketamine is relatively stable in its binding pocket. But in general, I think the uh, hydrogen and the hydrophobic uh, uh, interactions are conserved between S and r uh, ketamines. So we also uh, carried out a functional experiment uh, with all uh, above mentioned the residues uh, by disrupting the uh, hydrogen and the hydrophobic interactions. So as you can see that uh, those interactions uh, are, are, are mainly conserved between those two enantiomers. So uh, uh, additionally, we also uh, uh, noticed a residue. It's another aspargine, uh, 61, uh, 614 uh, residue in the actually on the glue and 2A subunit. So by mutating this uh, asparagine to alanine or to glutamine, uh, which we uh, get a significant reduction on the r -ketamine, but not uh, the s -ketamine. So I think with all those data together, we explained the, the similarity and the difference between those two enantiomers. So uh, with that, I would like to show this movie here. So I think in this work, we, uh, uh, by um, combining the CRAW-EM and the pharmacology, we, we reviewed the ketamine binding site in the human NMDA receptors. And by using the functional experiment and the in silico calculation, we reviewed that the hydrogen bond and the hydrophobic interactions are the key uh, binding interactions uh, with the uh, ketamine, between the ketamine and the NMDA receptors. So uh, I would uh, quickly move to the second part of my talk. Uh, uh, it's also a, uh, a, a recent publication from our group in Neuron. So uh, in, this, uh, in this work, we try to uh, review the molecular basis of the gating mechanism of the gluten one 2 a NMD receptors. So we would like to understand how those, this subtype is activated by the agonist glycine and the glutamate, or, or the, how it was uh, inhibited by the competitive antagonist CPP or another competitive antagonist CGP, or how this uh, channel activity was allosterically modulated by the modulator or channel blockers. So combining all those uh, 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 pharmacological tools and the CRAW-EM together, we uh, eventually uh, obtained a gallery of the gluten one 2 a NMD receptor CRAW-EM structures. Actually, the, the, the density was pretty decent. As you can see, we, we got uh, a uh, very clear density, electron density for most of the, uh, those uh, uh, molecules. We can see that this competitive 
uh, antagonist CPP. So it, uh, it competes with the same binding site of the glutamate. While this CGP compound, it competes uh, with the same binding site of the glycine. And this, uh, this is a GNE6901. So this is a compound developed by Gene Tech. So as you can see, it's an, an elasteric potentiator. So you can see that this molecule bind uh, in between the dimer interface between the GRU N1 and the GRU N2A uh, ligand binding domain. So with all those uh, structure together, we, we, we got, uh, uh, or by comparing those structures, we, we now got a more uh, molecular insight of how the receptor are activated, how the receptor are inhibited, or the receptor are anesthetically modulated. So I'm not going into en uh, into the <laughs> the detail of this long story. I just want to focus on the my talk with this uh, non AA bound structure. So this is non AA is short for the non amino acrid. So as you can see that, uh, so we, we got a very uh, nice density for this mo molecule. Uh, so you see the electron map looks like a diamond with this amine group facing up to the uh, electron, uh, to the, facing up to the extracellular domain of the receptor. So we, we were very confident to fit the, this molecule into this uh, electron density map. So uh, this, so as you can see, the binding site of this 9A molecule is in this linker cavity. So the linker cavity was previously thought to only play a role for the signal transduction. Uh, so it sends how the conformation, it sends the uh, conformation change of the extracellular domain and then uh, convert this uh, conformation change to the gate. So people have never discovered uh, uh, the ligand binding site in this linker cavity. And the NANA was also previously thought to bind in the same site as the ketamine. So we did as uh, based on our structure, we did assist, we did systematically mutations in the poor region, in the central vestibular region, and as well as this linker region. So as you can see that those uh, two residues, the asparagin uh, 616 in the GRU N1 and uh, the leucine 642 in GRU N2A. So those two are ketamine binding residues, as I mentioned before. So you can see that those uh, residues have uh, have almost no effect on the 9A sensitivity. And eventually we got uh, we, we got actually three mutations in the, this linker cavity. So actually the three uh, glutamate residues, when we mutate them, uh, we, we got a significant reduction on the 9A sensitivity. So with all those functional and uh, also structural uh, evidence, we show that uh, 9A indeed binding to this linker cavity and can also uh, modulate the channel function. So uh, uh, in the field, people have never tested if NANA also have some antidepressant effect in vivo. So we are currently doing that. So I, I just want to uh, quickly summarize the, this part. So we discovered a, a novel uh, ligand binding site in this linker cavity, and uh, we are working on the mechanisms in vivo. So uh, I think I would like to stop my talk here. Uh, I, I think thanks to the crowd EM and uh, we now we are able to decode the uh, structure of all NMD receptor subtypes uh, at, at atomic resolution. I think on one hand for the basic research, uh, uh, definitely the tomo uh, electron tomography would be the future it will help us to visualize the receptor architecture and assemble in the native synapse or neurons with more precise spatial and temporal uh, resolutions. Uh, uh, on another hand, I think we can, uh, for the drug development with all those high resolution structures, we can do uh, AI based uh, the novel drug design and uh, obtain more uh, more compound with the subtype specificity, then we can combine with the high throughput screening and the functional assays uh, to obtain more drug candidates for potential treatment of the neurological and uh, 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 psychiatric brain disorders. 
Okay, so uh, I'd like to stop my talk here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my talented student, uh, Zhang Youyi and Zhang Tongtong, uh, as well as my collaborator, Dr. Luo Cheng and Dr. Ye Fei at Shanghai Institute of Material Medical for, this, uh, for the ketamine story. I also would like to thank my student, uh, Wang Han, for, uh, and my collaborator, Pierre Paoletti, uh, for the 9A project. Uh, I'd like to thank you everyone in my lab and thank my findings and as a, my other collaborators. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ju, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question, how is cryo-EM different than other structural biology techniques? Does it open scientific doors that other structural biology, biology techniques didn't? And if so, how? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, I think in, in general, in structural biology field, there are three main techniques. So one is cryo-EM, and the other two are X-ray uh, crystallographer and the NMR. So before uh, cryo-EM is becoming so popular, so uh, I think the X-ray crystallographer is the main technique we use in the structural biology field. So I think the main, I think there are three main advantage of cryo-EM uh, compared with X-ray crystallographer. So first, so it, uh, it does not need a crystal. So this is the main advantage because before it uh, it typically take uh, for for ion channels for for membrane proteins it typically take uh, three to five years to get the crystals. So second, I think it uh, requires much less proteins compared with the X-ray. Uh, uh, third, I think it will. I, I think uh, uh, it uh, uh, it allows the conformational um, uh, different conformational state. Uh, in your protein sample, which means that you can really uh, get uh, have a, a, homo a, a heterogeneous sample, but you will eventually also resolve the structure in different states. Yeah, so that's the three um, advantages of crowd em in my point of view, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ju. The next question here, um, do do cinnamolgus monkeys have the same NMDA receptors? Uh, to my knowledge, I think yes. So, uh, but I have to check. Uh, we, we did the sequence alignment between the human NMDA receptors and the rodent NMDA receptors. I think for, uh, they are like 98% uh, conserved. All right, thank you. Our next question, how long does it take for the cryo-EM analysis image acquisition to 3D models? Uh, I think it really depends on the protein. So in our case, uh, it, uh, it usually takes like one, one month, 
But uh, uh, if you really have, if you, you if you have a very homogeneous sample, typically you will get it like within two weeks. Yeah. But if your sample is too heterogeneous, maybe you need to try many times before you get the final structure. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Ju. The next question is. Let's see here. My screen is jumping. I'm sorry. How long does it take to learn how to do cryo EM if you've never done it before? Uh, I think several months. Okay, that doesn't seem like too long. And the next question, where can we access cryo EM if we don't have an in-house cryon electron microscope? Uh, I think now, uh, uh, I think, it, well, I, I just know the situation in China. So we have like a national, national uh, protein center, which uh, uh, is open to all the individual labs. And also uh, a lot of universities and institutes, even, even the companies, they, 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 they have uh, bought uh, CryoEM equipment in the past uh, three years. So I think, as, well, they are very accessible, yeah. Okay, thank you again. The next question, what kinds of discoveries do you foresee being possible with accessible cryo EM? Uh, I think the, it will really uh, speed up the, 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 the basic understanding of those uh, um, microprotein or, or protein complex and also accelerate the, the, the drug discovery uh, uh, process, yeah. Okay, thank you again. Let's see, um, we have a few more questions. Yes. Is there much, spe is there much species diversity in GLU-Rs? I imagine that's like glutamate receptor, but I'm not sure, as almost all in vivo studies are carried out in rodents. Uh, to be honest, I think uh, uh, how the I grew as uh, assembled in in native or in in, in real brain is is not completely answered by the field. So there are two uh, uh, very promising uh, studies carried out by by Eric Gould's lab from Volume Institute. So they elucidated. So the, so actually actually they extracted the native AMPA receptors from the rat brain and then uh, they do a 3D classification, try to to visualize how those receptors and even the auxiliary proteins are associated in the real brain. So I think this, that will be the future. So people, uh, most of the lab uh, who study the ion channels are, are using the recombinant expression system uh, nowadays. But I think for the future, people will uh, jump jump into the native uh, uh, tissue, uh, try to answer those questions in in, in native uh, in native brain. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ju. Next question. Uh, let's see. This person says, "Thanks, Dr. Ju. Wonderful talk. Could you please illustrate a bit more? What is your plan to combine cryotomo and AI-based drug design for a new drug?" <laughs> That's a great question. So I think that uh, there are two parts. For the cryotomo, is uh, I think we we mainly use it for the for the basic research discovery. So as I as I uh, the previous question as I just mentioned. So. On one hand, we will use the uh, native extracted uh, proteins to do a single single particle uh, analysis. So uh, then the next step will move to the tomo, uh, tom, uh, tomo then to visualize how those receptors, uh, 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 the architecture or the association of those receptors in the real synapse and uh, and uh, and the neurons. But I think for AI-based drug design, so this is another part for the application. So I think this we actually we are already doing that. So uh, just based on our um, uh, uh, structures from single particle uh, analysis, then we we are doing collaboration with AI people, and then to see we can find more uh, NMDA-specific drugs, yeah, based on the structure, yeah. 
All right, thank you again. Our next question. Amazing talk. Thank you for putting this together. Just one question. You mentioned that newer drugs will be designed de novo. Do you imagine that newer drugs will look like ketamine? <laughs> That's also a good question. So I think all those uh, people are doing ketamine and its derivatives in the field, but the, all previous uh, derivatives are just uh, designed based on the ketamine molecule. So we are doing we are doing that based on the CASB and NMDA receptors, the three D conformation, the real space uh, structure. So we are, I think that's the major difference. So we will see if was the, the drug we de designed by AI will also maintain its faster antidepressant effect. Uh, we will see. Yeah, I think hopefully I will tell you the the answer in the in the next few years. Yeah. All right, thank you again, Dr. Ju. Next question. Uh, can you discuss the possible role of water molecules in the binding of ketamine to the NMDA receptor? Uh, to be honest, at our resolution between 3.5 and uh, to, 4 an uh, to 4 angstrom resolution, we, we, we were really not able to see the water molecule. Uh, but uh, it's true, even even we are thinking to do it uh, by by the modeling by md simulation yeah but uh, uh, currently the short answer is i don't know yeah but uh, we we definitely need, would like to push the resolution and uh, hopefully we will see see it uh, in in the near future yeah all right thanks again next question what is the difficulty in finding the ketamine binding pocket and what is the ideal final resolution we need um the difficulty is the ketamine ketamine binding pocket is in the in the transmembrane domain and the the nmd receptor is a membrane protein so we have to extract it from the membrane by detergent so so the, the whole transmembrane domain is surrounded by those uh, uh dirty detergents so that's the the, the main difficulty yeah uh, ideally, uh, I think if we can go beyond uh, beyond three angstrom, I think definitely we can can have a better better uh, structural insight. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. Our next question. I would like to ask you why didn't you choose the other two NMDA receptors, GLU into C and GLU into D? Um, but instead, you chose glue into A and glue into B for the research. Yes, this I have mentioned in the introduction. So uh, I think in the in the adult uh, full brain region, where 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 like I, I mentioned the two brain region, like uh, cortex and the hippocampus. So I think the grand one, two A and the two B, they are the main subtypes in those uh, brain regions. Yes, but we also uh, I think uh, it's a good good. Uh, question. I, I think if you look at the sequence alignment in the transmembrane domain, actually the the residue uh, for ketamine binding residues between 2C and the 2D, they are, they are also conserved. So I think the general mechanism for for ketamine binding, they are like uh, they are probably conserved between uh, 2A, 2B, 2C, and the 2D. Yeah. All right, thank you again. Our next question, given the importance of the single, single amino acid residues for ketamine binding to NMDA receptors, are there additional or other targets where ketamine binds in the brain? Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, uh, people, uh, because, uh, People, I think in the field, there's a debate that if ketamine's antidepressant effect is NMDA receptor dependent or not. Uh, as you know, ketamine is a small molecule, so uh, it's also a dirty drug. So if you, I think if you go to really high concentration, ketamine can definitely bind to other receptors and proteins. Uh, but I think in the concentration for the antidepressant, as you might know, so typically in clinical trials, they use the 0.2 to 0.5 uh, milligram per, per kilogram. 
So I think uh, this is very low concentration. In my opinion, only NMD receptors are sensitive to this concentration of ketamine molecule. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Dr. Ju. Next question, and looks like this is the last one that we have time for. Are there any allosteric sites on NDMA receptors that might be helpful? Uh, yes. Uh, so we have another story. We are we are we are we are under review. So we find a gluten two C two D subtype specific uh, uh, allosteric inhibitor, which can which can act uh, to the only to the two C two D, not the two A two B receptors. And we also showed it it uh, have some antidepressant effect uh, in vivo. Yeah. I think the, the answer is yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any final comments uh, for our audience, Dr. Ju, before we go? Uh, no. Thank you for everyone for their great question. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Zhu, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Bye-bye.